Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dak Xavier Josiah, the host of ACMG Presents Talk Time Live, the podcast. You want to catch up with all of our podcast shows and hear from some of the hottest names in all of anime, comics, movies, and games, such as... This is Miley Flanagan, the voice of Naruto. This is Stephanie Shea, the voice of Sailor Moon. This is Ruben Langdon, the voice of Ken Masters and Dante from Devil May Cry. Hey there, this is Kyle Abair, the voice of Ryu from Street Fighter V. This is Chris Battle, character designer of Teen Titans Go! Here's your chance to check out all of that and more on Talk Time Live. Live.com. TalkTimeLive.com provides all of our ACMG content with new and previous episodes, exclusive interviews, articles, and much more. Visit TalkTimeLive.com and let us help you learn to let go, live life, and love all things ACMG. Talk Time Live. This is Miley Flanagan, the voice of Naruto, and you are listening to ACMG Presents Talk Time Live. Believe it! It's time for your Talk Time Live exclusive. You are now about to witness the strength of geek knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, on the show with me right now is an actor who plays a character that throws more shade on people than anyone in pop culture. He is the voice of Shikamaru Naru on the legendary hit series Naruto, Naruto Shippuden, and the recently released on Toonami Baruto, Naruto Next Generation. He also plays characters on Habanero, Hab- I'm sorry, Habanero of the Iron Fortress, Digimon, Shinzo, and much more. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Tom Gibbous to the show. How are you doing, Tom? I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure. I pretty much, I'm almost to the point I can be considered hokage at this point if i have one more <laughs> member of your show <laughs> well there are a lot of us that's the nice thing i know exactly it's it's, all, it's, it's, this is this is kind of like a scratch off like you go if you go to like a uh a, a subway or something like that and they clip off your card or something like that yeah <laughs> in this case, collect the whole set <laughs> like, who's left it's two i think it's two more people left <laughs> I haven't got, but oh, so you're waiting to the end to get to me. That I see how that works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> keep it going. Keep it going. You know, the later, the better. <laughs> but no, thank you for being on the show, man. It's been awesome. I love what you've done. And congratulations, by the way, because you have been this character for a very long time. I mean, over a decade. It's been awesome. Um, yeah, I think 2005, yeah. maybe it was 2004 we auditioned for it, and then mm-hmm. 2005 we actually started uh, recording right. on the well, show. Well, let's talk about that. How did you learn about the role of Shikamaru? Well, uh, there was an audition, and I think it was in like 2004, and mm-hmm. just about everybody in town was going out for this audition. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> so I got a call, and I you know, I can't, I couldn't tell you like, I don't really have an agent, believe it or not, mm-hmm. when it comes to voiceover work. It's it's more like whenever I work for one person or a director or a right. company, then they'll call me up and they'll say, hey, can you audition for this? And then that, that's kind of how it works. Right. For me, anyway. It, it's not true for everybody. Right. Um, uh, it's not from a lack of trying to get an agent. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just in this particular area, this is um, – I, I, I don't really use an agent for it. But anyway, neither here nor there. Uh, so I got called in and they had me read uh, for three roles. I read for Naruto. Mm-hmm. I read for Shikamaru Nara and I read for Choji. Oh, wow. And um, and I thought of the three, I thought Choji was probably going to be my best chance. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when they called me and they said, hey, we'd like you to do Shikamaru Nara, I was like, wait. Was that the cool guy? Because <laughs> I, I think in my original audition, I did him sort of like a, you know, like a dude, man, yeah. you know, almost not 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 full California. But, you know, kind of that was sort of sort of what, how I keyed into it. Yeah. Um, I got, uh, you know, I was it, it, that was sort of my ins- inspiration for the character. And then once they brought me in and we kind of dialed it in a little bit better and it, it got to more of the uh, – but there's still that sort of, you know, whatever, what a drag. You know, it's – it's he's like the the cool guy, the – you know, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, but it almost starts out surfer dude. Um, in, but prior to that, I had played characters that were excitable, young, you know, like a Naruto type. The guys yeah. that are like, we need to get out of here. You know, that kind of guy. <laughs> and, uh, and, and real high-pitched. And so I thought – you know, I'm dragging on the bottom of my voice to do Shikamaru, and I thought, you know, they're not going to cast me as that. They're going <laughs> to – if I got any – not that I would be the lead in the show, but that's why I thought Choji was going to be the – was going to be my key there. I thought, you know, he's a chubby kid, and that's yeah. sort of me. And um, 
so anyway, I, I thought that was going to be my best bet, but it, it just turned out that they gave me Shikamaru. And, uh, and at first I remember thinking it's great that I'm this character because then I never have to say my name right? because <laughs> other characters have to say Shikamaru Nara, but I don't know. And in the beginning I kept having to write it down and then write it phonetically and then kind of figure it out. And, uh, at that time I, I found out that there was all this, um, uh, manga on it and all of like it was hugely popular and it was right. a hugely right. popular show in Japan, but I had never really been aware of it. Right. And right. then um, once you once it gets into your head, once you sort of hear Naruto and then you go, oh, that thing, then all of a sudden you start seeing it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it, it was like I'd go to the store and there'd be like <laughs> toys and cards and, you know, stuff like that, like game, uh, on the checkout line. And you go. Well, the video the video games came later because mm -hmm. we did the voices for that. But um, right. he, but early on the just the image of that character and you never knew I you know I probably saw it every day no had no idea what it was didn't you know uh, sort of like a Hello Kitty thing it's like everywhere and you just didn't once I became kind of aware of it it was like oh my gosh this is it's surrounding us like it's everywhere and I thought that was kind of cool and I didn't I had no idea how big it was so. In playing Shikamaru, and by the way, thank you for mentioning that because I too had phonetic problems trying to. Uh, I had, I was practicing all the way up into this uh, interview to try to say it's that. It's tough. It, it really I mean, is. Well, and then you uh, add the last is, name to it. <laughs> that is probably my biggest challenge on the show. Yeah. Is because I do. I would say. 80% of the exposition on that show is done by Shikamaru because mm -hmm. I have to explain. Who these people are, what they're doing, how we're going to defeat them. Right. <laughs> you know, aspect, whatever yeah. it is. So I, you know, it's I'm like, oh, no, here comes a name. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all, you know, and, and it's funny because you'll be in the booth, you're wearing your headset and you go, uh, how do you say this? And and then the director will say, it's Akatsuki. And you go, <laughs> Akatsuki. And they go, no, no, Akatsuki. And I, I'm like. Wait, isn't that what I just said? <laughs> and so then you're doing the lines and you're doing the loops and you're like, uh, you go through and you you say it the way you want to say it and do the whole thing. And then then as soon as they all cut, you go, did I say it right? Because <laughs> I can't even remember. And it, it's funny how your brain can't even remember it for like that three seconds that you have to put it together. Right. And then it comes back. So you better have said it the same same way twice. I you really, know what I mean? I really – honestly think that you've made a bunch of our listeners feel amazingly better after hearing that. <laughs> and I have somebody kind of whispering in my ear to tell me the correct, and we've most of, you know, they bring you back. Um, so you do, you do a regular job and you lay down your lines and do the whole thing. And then every once in a while they'll bring you back and they go like, we have, we have a bunch of uh, corrections lines that have to be redone. Right. Most now, sometimes it's performance, Mm -hmm. Uh, they didn't like the performance, you know, once it was laid down, they were like, nah, we can get a better take on that. Right. Uh, sometimes it's like they've changed a character's name or how to pronounce a name or something like that. And that was 90% of the ones I've had to redo were because we've changed the pronunciation right. or these characters were saying it this way and you said it that way. Correct. And sometimes if you're the first one in to record, I'll lay it down and it's like, okay, we this is how we're going to say this name. And then I'd say it and I'd record my lines. And then somebody else would come in. And by that time, they realized, oh, no, 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 no. It's really pronounced this. <laughs> so then they have to bring you back in to re-record and get it right, you right. know. So uh, – And when it comes know. to your actual character, uh, do you have any creative input in the development of your character? or Because I know there are some changes from the, the Japanese version in accordance to try to you know assimilate into our culture so do you ever are you able to give any input into your particular character well i'll tell you this it's it's pretty much so, so they there is a japanese template so yeah. you're you're basically going off something that already exists mm -hmm. right so they what the writers try and do is they take this source material which is japanese the you know the anime has already been made so we get it and there's a there's a voice actor uh, in Japan who's already laid down his track. Right. So the first run of the script is they do a strict translation, uh -huh. right? And then that doesn't always match up. Right. Right? Because <clears throat> sometimes it's too long or it's too short and uh sort of in the same way that like we have ways of saying things 
that are like a shorthand. Correct. Right? So if I said, hey, you're very much like a Santa Claus, uh-huh. we would know that that means you're a person who gives gifts and is very friendly and warm because we know who Santa Claus is. Right. But if you went to Japan, they'd have no idea who Santa Claus is. Right. And in the same way, they lay down things that are like shorthand for them that people understand what that is and what that's supposed to mean. And we we have this complex explanation of what this you know very short line would be and so so now we've got to figure out a way to write that line to save the intent of what the author the original source material was without you know but you still have you only have a limited amount of space to fit it into those flaps and i'll tell you uh the one thing about our show uh, as opposed to a lot of you know the big old joke on anime used to be that uh, like the voices and the and the and the sync didn't match, particularly right? the nineties. Yes, <laughs> you know, back, yeah, back, way or even way back, like in the sixties and seventies, like that was the joke, right? Yeah. Like the foreign dubbed movie and like how bad it is, and like there was no even attempt. It was just like you're strictly translating it into English, the right? Speed racer it, error, another. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> We spend – and I got to give Studiopolis and everybody involved with this show, mm-hmm. um, they're obsessive about making the, the sync right. right. And I'll tell you, a lot of people that don't know the show, like my parents, you know, they've seen episodes and stuff. They, they don't get it or understand it. Right. But they, they don't get the idea that this show was made in Japan first. Mm-hmm. They go, do they send it to Japan and then translate it to Japanese? Uh, Is that how that works? And I was like – no. And they go, but the mouths, that, that all fits, you know, like it all, like, how does that, how do you fix the mouth? Do yeah. they reanimate that? <laughs> <laughs> because you, because it's so good. We're so good at hitting it. Mm-hmm. And I'll, you know, I'll say that now there'll be people go, you know, in episode 725, <laughs> the third scene in, exactly. there's a spot where it's really off. But for the most part, we've made that a priority. To make it fit, to make it make sense. Now, where you, that's where you kind of run into some of the hardcore fans because the hardcore fans are like, you're changing the source material. But it's almost impossible to do the source material because the way the Japanese use the language as opposed to the way we use language. So you're trying to tell a story, and it needs to stay fluid, and it can't be a simple translation. Yeah, and only anybody who's actually seasoned in both countries would understand that ideology and such of how – they conduct themselves, the cultural f- aspects. Yeah. Well, for example, it's Shikamara Nara. But if we were in Japan, it's Nara Not, Shikamaru. Right, exactly. Because they give their surname first. and that, You know what I mean? So it's like this whole – even that. Well, not only that, the, the R's will be – go at the end of a sentence. The know? R's will be a D, <laughs> you know, or be pronounced as a, like a D. In the right, search, right. you know, so you have that pronunciation as well. So, so yeah, we make a big deal of trying to make things fit. Yeah. And – um. It's funny, one of my last sessions over there, I was thinking, we, we do this thing like when a line is too short, uh, we have this thing called filler. You know, you do a filler. Right. Right. So, for example, if the line was something like, we have a problem, right? Mm-hmm. So now you need to make it a little longer. So right. what you do is you would do something like, we have a big problem, mm. right? And then if you need it longer, it's, I think we have a big problem, <laughs> right? And then you even more, you can go, so – I think we have a big problem. Uh, and there's so many of these, you add these filler words, right? right? And then you can even do things like, so I think we have a problem now. Wow. <laughs> so I so I think that we have a big problem now. So clearly it seems that we have a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it just seems clear that right now – we all have a very big, big problem. So you know, so you're gonna see how you can. You're saying the exact same thing, right? But you you're adding all these extra words to uh, to make it fit and, and fit the time. Uh, yeah, to fit the time. Yeah, and everything. Right, because a lot of times, like, oh, he's continuing to talk. And the best thing is when they do cutaways. Yeah. Because once when the camera's not on the character talking, mm-hmm. right, and you can then fit in a ton of stuff that, that isn't there, <laughs> right. right? Because, it, you know, you're seeing the reaction of the other character, and so you're still hearing Shikamaru's voice, and so um, it, it, you can extend it. And that's, that's a beautiful place to kind of pick up a lot of uh, – when you have a very short amount of flaps and you have to get a lot in, yeah. you can do it on a cutaway, right? So that's – uh, that's kind of how some of the little tricks there that they try and um, to make it work and to make it fit and to make it it's got to make sense. And you've got to have a story that's kind of fluid 
and 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 all that. So uh, it's it's real interesting. So I want to talk about right now one of the most memorable moments of the Shipping and series was involving your character involved in the situation when his sensei Asuma died at the hands of the oh, Akatsuki. Yeah. Oh yeah. One of I, honestly, I'm not joking. Even before I knew you were coming on the show, that is always one of my favorite moments in, in of the entire series. It's the beginning. It was like the prelude to much more bigger things going to happen in the series. But just the setting of Shikamaru with his father and they're playing Go, and it's just a touching, yeah. touching scene. What it's were your it's fi- really well written, I it, think. It's so well written. It was one of those episodes that I can sit down, have somebody who's not an anime fan, and let them realize how sophisticated this genre of television it really is. And like that moment for me that you performed was no different from anything that I watch on primetime television. It was that deep. It was that sensitive. It was that empathetic. Oh, well, thank you. Thank it you. Was, it was, it has, it's absolutely one of the most memorable moments. When in regards to you playing that part, where, uh, what were your feelings uh, about those scenes? And, you know, how were you about preparing for them? You don't get a lot of heads up, you know, when you come in to record. Um, basically, we have the the show in front of us, you're watching the actual animation Mm -hmm. and you're sort of reading along and you're going. And so you're kind of living it in real time, Mm -hmm. line by line, loop by loop. You're kind of moving through the script and you're like, Oh, where, where is this going? Where, well, well, what's happening? (laughs) (laughs) Oh no, he's going to. And then, so I think if you're keyed in to what the writers are, are telling you and the animation is there too. So you can see like, how the emotion is played on the faces and, and you know, how important this is right. and, and then take moments to bring it soft or quiet and, and really like feel that. And then, and then let that sort of, eventually it's let the rage out. Right. So right. when he, when he fights Hedon in the forest, it's like, this was a whole thing about, I'm going to get you back. <laughs> you <know>? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and um so so you're, you're you're sort of experiencing it at the same in real time and uh and i think you get a lot of great performances that way and i think it takes a certain kind of actor too i know a lot of actors need a lot of preparation um and they get us maybe you know you can get a lot of depth from a lot of prep which is good like right. and if, if you have the luxury to do that like if you're on a movie and they send you the script ahead of time right. And, you know, you, you know where you're doing most of the time when you're working like on a film, Mm -hmm. you, you're, you're really concentrating on what you're going to shoot that day and what little sec you take a little section of the script and you just work the hell out of it. Now you're familiar with it. You've read the script and you just work the heck out of that one little scene and then you go and block it and then you start shooting it. And by the end of the day, you've done it so many times that you know exactly where all the beats are and how you're going to, how you're going to play it out. Right. And everybody's happy and everybody signs off on that performance, you know, or they don't. And they and you get fired. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let, well, let's hope that, that never happens. <laughs> this, we get us a new actor here we, we can get to uh, get going on that. Um, so it's nice to have that kind of prep. Yeah. Um, but with us, because it, it's already been done and you're coming in and a lot of times it's like you drop right in the middle of a scene where you just have two lines. Mm-hmm. And so you don't know a lot of the stuff that's happened before (laughs) and you don't know what's happened, what's going to happen after you just come in and you have to say, uh, you know, we need to back them up, you know, or whatever you're going to do or, uh, oh my gosh, he's going down (laughs) stuff like that. Commenting on the screen, on this, on the scene. But, uh, we have great directors on the show. We've had several over the years. But they'll you'll come in and you go okay so this line happens basically what's happened is you've just seen Asuma go down mm-hmm. and uh, the bad guy is standing over him he's he's he tricked him into drinking his blood and now he's going to finish do a finishing move on Asuma right. and you're watching this so <laughs> so you're standing on the side and so we're gonna play it for you in Japanese and you can see it and here's the lines written down in front of you and then and then you you go into it so they give you a little bit of background and they tell you a little bit about where it's going and then to try and get the best performance out of you that they possibly can. Right. And uh, generally that works. Um, 
like I, like I was kind of saying before, there's different kinds of actors, and I think the ones that do the best in voiceover work like this mm-hmm. in, in, in anime, uh, I'm really good at – I've always felt one of my strong suits is the cold read. Mm-hmm. And I have a big improv background. I know Miley does. We used to work at a improv theater in Minneapolis right. together. And it's being able to take that moment and just jump in in the middle and you know sort of play it out. Now, I don't get to say what I want to say or do what I want to do, but I get – you can jump into those emotions. You can jump into that scene. You can understand what's going on and go, oh, okay, I'm going to play it like this, right. right? And the people that have those instincts do really well in this sort of uh, artistic endeavor. The ones that don't, <clears throat> uh, I don't think do as particularly well, but then they're, they might be a better stage actor or they might be a better film actor or right. a television actor. Um, uh, I, I, you know, sitcom actors, you know, the comedy guys, that's kind of, I'm kind of in that range doing, I did a lot of comedy and, right. uh, it is more, especially with improv, because you're jumping in and playing crazy characters, and you're, you know, you can go high to low in two seconds, and you can change emotions without no ramp up because that scene's over, and you know you were playing a pirate, and now you're playing a five year old kid, and so you can make that transition, you can make that cut, and move on to the next thing, and a lot of actors have to, I need to put that aside and then pick this up, and that, and they don't. This this sort of form doesn't allow you to have that luxury. Now it's funny that you said that too, because uh, when Molly was on the show, and we had one of our uh, one of the times she was on the show, we did have a conversation quite similar to this, in a sense that not everybody can do voiceover work if they're like actors or you know normally actors in prime time or whatever like who are not used to it because it's such a different structure, in a sense, and it's it's mostly in reference to sometimes when they when they cast a major name that has never done, yes. you know, never really done animation before. And it becomes tricky sometimes. Yeah. Well, there's, I'll tell you, there's a couple of different things. It's changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, like when I, when Miley and I started this show and with the rest of the cast, mm-hmm. uh, that was a time before what's, uh, they had pro tools. That's a computer thing that allows you to manipulate the sound on the soundboard. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, in the early days, the early days, <laughs> 2000, <laughs> you know, yeah, right. doing voiceover in around 2000, um, you had to hit it. Like they'd say, OK, you got six beats. You, this is the line and you need to hit it mm-hmm. like you need to make it fit. And they would have you do it again and do it again and do it again. And, you know, a little longer, a little shorter, a little faster, a little mm-hmm. slower, a little, you know, and then there's also the performance in it, you know. Now we've lost the emotion. So now you got to do it again, that timing, but then you need to bring in the emotion. And then it's like, oh, you sped up because you got emotional. <laughs> right. And it's like, ah! <laughs> you know, and so it was very frustrating. And it really was a skill because you had to juggle all those balls. You know, you had to stay in character. You had to know what your character was doing, what it want, what the character wanted stay true to that character and you're always mindful of is this how Shikamaru would say that is this is this really him and every once in a while I'll say I think I think I was too high or let me try that a different way because I don't you know out of context maybe it made sense but when I'm thinking about him maybe in the grand scheme this that wasn't way to play it maybe that's too funny for him or too light you know maybe he would have taken it a little more serious So you have to keep all that in mind, and then you have to make it fit in the thing. And then along came Pro Tools, and it was probably around the time we started this show. And Pro Tools allowed it so you could lay down – you could do a performance and get a great performance, and then they would say, you know what? It's a little long. So they would say, you know, we can try and slide it, and they can slide it forward or back. Or if you missed uh, the beats, you came in late or came in early, they could – so now instead of the actor having to do 500 ta- takes, what they do is they go, you lay one or two takes, they get happy with the performance, right. and then they have the engineer is trying to make it fit precisely to the flaps. And every once in a while they'll go, yeah, it's still not working. I might have to, we might have to rewrite the line. And that's where I say, you know, they'll put in a so or a, a that or a what or you know they try and find your rhythm. I remember kind of maybe two years into it, I, I ran into one of the writers. Who, who was translating the shows and putting out scripts. Mm-hmm. And he was saying, like, 
he got to the point where he could hear my voice in his head. So he knew how slowly or how fast I was because there's a rhythm to Shikamaru. Right. You know, and if you have a good writer, you can, they, they can go, OK, well, we, we're not going to fill this up with words because he's slow. You know, we're, his voice is so we can we can have him fill this this gap by just doing the performance slowly. You know, uh, it's it's a little frustrating, too, because you can't take a pause. You can't you know, you can't make you have a roadmap and you have to follow that roadmap and then you have to make it your own and, and make sure that the acting part of it is correct. Right. You know, and so it, it is a little tricky in that regard. Now, with original animation. You can basically do whatever you want. You have that conversation with the director. They say, you know, say the line this way, do it, do it like this, or this is what's happening in the scene. Now give us your best shot. And then the actor gives their performance and then the director will tweak it and say, maybe he's a little less angry and a little more this, a little more that, whatever. Let's try it again. And you do it again. And when they're finally happy, they then send it off to be animated the way you performed it. Right. So if you wanted to put a pause in a line, you can put a pause there if, for dramatic purposes or comedic purposes. But if they didn't do that way in Japan, <laughs> if they didn't put a pause in there, you can't put a pause in there. Right. And, uh, and that's probably one of my biggest – I get rusty on it and I end up getting into my head and I'm, I'm acting it more than I'm thinking of the you can't take a break here. And so I constantly get the note like you can't take a pause. <laughs> <laughs> Look, after 400 plus episodes, I think you'll be okay. <laughs> you know what it is? It is funny. It is. It's like a skill, and because I'll go months where they don't call me in, because uh, what they try and do is get me in as many episodes as they possibly can while they're, you know, make hay while the sun is shining. So they'll say, oh, we got about six episodes, maybe 60, 60 loops or something that we want you to do. So we're gonna book you a two-hour session, and that's that'll end up being over. You know, like I said, five or six episodes could even be more because a lot of Shikamaro's lines are at the beginning of the episode and the end of the episode. And it might be that I'll have one or two lines. Mm -hmm. And so um, they they put them all together to kind of save time for the for the actor, you know. So how did I start that? <laughs> how did I get into that beat? You you were flowing. You were flowing like the shadows. I know. But, I started... <laughs> but let, me, uh, let me take you back. Let me take you back a little yeah. bit. When you started and fell in love with acting, did you have an ideal role that you wanted to take on, whether movie or TV, uh, that you wanted to be a part of growing up? No, not really. You know, I guess I got to say the reason I did fall in love with acting, and I remember just from a little kid, I just wanted to act. It was, and it was more of the idea for me anyway. People would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd be like, I want to be everything. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a cowboy. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an astronaut. I want to do all of that. You know, like, don't make me pick. So, well, the one thing I'm going to pick is an actor then. You see what I'm saying? Because then maybe I can be an act astronaut and maybe I could be a firefighter. Maybe right. I can be a plumber. Maybe I can be an accountant. You know, it doesn't – you don't – you can be everybody. So I kind of thought when I was a kid anyway, that was the – uh that was sort of where my head was at, you know, and, and I would act out little scenes when I was, when I was little, little, you know, uh, and, and sing songs for my grandparents and stuff like that, you know, which a lot of kids, a lot of actor kids do that. Um, but I do remember that when I was, let's see, 1980, let's say five, you can probably correct me when I give you the reference, but, uh, <laughs> I remember seeing back to the future. Mm-hmm. And I was in Minnesota at that time, and I, th I think I was in college or just – maybe I was still in high, uh, high school, graduated at 83, so I think I was in college. And and I saw that movie, and I went, that's what I want to be doing. I've got to get out to California. This That's – just be, being – any role in that movie would have been just fantastic. You know what I mean? Like I want to be a part of something like that. Like this is so exciting, so – fantastic. I, I would just love to do that. You know, how many people go, would you love to be in Star Wars? It's like, absolutely. I don't care. Yeah, right, I, without a doubt. <laughs> I will play Jar Jar freaking Binks, you know? <laughs> and, you know, that that's the sad thing about that character. Um, I, I worked with that guy and I can't remember his name right now, but, um, you know, the fans were so hard on him for doing that. And he's just, 
you know, he's just an actor doing his job so It really great. should have been more of the studio or George Lucas or whoever was responsible for creating that character, not the actor. I agree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And um, yeah, but, you know, but just how I mean, would you turn it down? You know, maybe in hindsight, you might go, wait a second. So in a way, I think the fans can be a little rough, you, you know, know, and Nar- well, the first Naruto time- has that a little bit, too. Well, here's because- the thing. Here's the thing with um, Jar Jar. I, he was the first controversial character of <laughs> yeah. that era doing yeah. something of that nature. And I think when the person jumped at it, all they heard was Star Wars. They didn't think twice at first. They didn't use critical thinking. Now that is like the gen- the uh, catalyst of all these other type of characters that have come after that. So people start to think now. So you know, at right. that time, I, I can't I can understand why the guy jumped at it because he probably was like, "This is a Star Wars thing. This is big for my career." Yeah, no, I I mean, like I said, wouldn't you, you know, wouldn't you jump at it if they offered you a Star Wars anything tomorrow? You'd be like, oh yeah, I'm in. What do you want me to do? And I, I feel bad for him that it, he didn't have a great experience. And I know that he. Like the fans were just brutal, and you know you become sort of a joke, mm-hmm. in uh, and it's tough. And uh, I was starting to to say the thought that the, that happens a little bit in Naruto too, in that we have hardcore fans that you know. Uh, it's funny. I run into people. What do you do? It's like, well, I do voice acting and mm-hmm. anything I might have heard, and I'd be like, well, I do the um, you know the English voice for uh, Shikamaru Nara on Naruto, mm-hmm. and they'll be like, oh, I only I watch that show, but I only watch it in the Japanese. Oh God. Yeah. And, I, call, and I, I call those people the anime uppity community. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm standing right in front of you, and I just <laughs> told you what I did. So what you could have said is, oh, that's interesting. I love that show, and we could have moved on, and that would have been it. You don't even have to – but to say I only watch it in the original Japanese. Like, Okay, so I told you that I do work on the show though, right? <laughs> The anime uppity, ladies and gentlemen. That is my. That is a clear. Just out of politeness, you could yeah. say, you know, or hey, I know the same storyline. I can talk about these characters with you. I can, you know what I mean. We we could have a conversation, but no, unbelievable. You know. <laughs> but you know, there is a thing, and I think it's a, it's maybe somewhat true about all fandom in general is yeah. that we love things so much uh, that we uh, that we kind of pr- are so protective of it yeah. that. It's so precious. It becomes that that anybody that makes a change or does anything, we we don't like it. You know, we right. and it also it's a little bit in music too. You know, like you hear a band or an artist and you you like, oh yeah, I love this guy, and then they start to blow up uh-huh. and everybody starts talking about them, and then they're starting to play it at the uh, spin studio down the street and <laughs> right. you know, like, well, at spin how, cycle or something, and you're like, that's not what that music was for. You know. <laughs> well, Tom, here's how I here's how I see that situation, and that's why I coined the phrase anime uppity because here's the situation and i base this on perspective yes you may like the uh japanese uh dubbing that's fine however don't come across like it's the end all be all of it because we don't know what the community and culture of that country is thinking about those particular actors for all we know not god forbid those characters probably suck (laughs) <laughs> to them, but we're praising them as if be, only because it's of culture. Right, right. And that's that's usually my case. It's like you just appreciate everything and everybody for what it is, and not try to be snooty or elitist about it. That's my only. Yeah, kick I kind of think that's true about life. I think you can uh, just about any situation. You can say, you know. I'm into this, you're into that. And it's like, well, that's great you're into that. Tell right. me more about that. I would like to understand that better. Correct. You know, but I'm still into this. And and if you let me, I'll share what I'm into. Mm-hmm. And let's be positive about the whole thing. Right. right? As you know, especially when it comes to art. Uh it's like if you don't like the Avengers movies, then don't watch them. Correct. But if somebody else enjoys them, why do you have to ruin it for them? <laughs> you know what I mean? And in the same thing with like whatever it is, if you're into Hello Kitty or if you're into, you know, just be like, hey, that's great. Right. You know, I it's not my thing, but great. Good for you. And, you know, I, I'm glad you enjoy it. And, right. and you don't have to be so dismissive of what other people enjoy. Right. Uh, I don't know. It's a human nature thing. I think it's just the, like I said, with the music, uh, people get that way. You get a little band you like, and then the, they blow up, and, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, they sold out. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Metallica. I heard too many Metallica stories like that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's like, oh, uh, yeah, they were good back when they did the first album, but right. you know, it's <laughs> – it's okay to have an opinion, but you know, let's let's it try. And it be, shouldn't dictate be, everybody else's. 
Yeah, just let's be happy, people. How about that? <laughs> so you grew up, if I'm correct, you grew up in Minnesota, correct? I did. I grew up in Minnesota, West St. Paul. Learned learned all your craft and everything from over there. Did the education programs there help hone your uh, craft as an actor, or did you develop more and evolve when you uh, hit the West Coast? Uh, I would say Minnesota was a great, great place to learn. We have great theater in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. Um there, I, there used to be a statistic that there's more theater per capita in Minneapolis, Minnesota, than there is in New York City. Huh. And there's opportunities there. And you know what? I, you know what? I really, the thing I really love about Minneapolis was people go to theater to go see theater, mm-hmm. and people perform to perform. Now, what I mean by that is, when you go to a show out here in L.A., you perform. Because you hope there's an agent in the crowd. You perform mm-hmm. because this is a stepping stone to the something else. Right. You do comedy so that you can get on a sitcom. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. I'm just saying when you're in Minnesota and you're doing a comedy show, you are in that moment with that audience who wants to be entertained, who's out on a date with their girlfriend mm-hmm. and you know having drinks and everybody's having fun. And that moment is like very real. Right. And it's really nice. And I'm t- whether you're doing a drama or comedy, most my a lot of my I shouldn't say most because it's pretty mixed, but I've done Shakespeare and all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, that audience is very they're there to see that show. They're not there for any other reason. They're not there looking for talent. They're not. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the actors are all there because, hey, they got cast in this show and they want to do it. You right. know, it's and kind of, uh, it kind of sounds like a Socrates cafe of artists of all kinds. Yeah, it's there's a purity to it. Right. Right. And there's again, there's nothing wrong with trying to advance your career and, you know, try and do things. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. And to do a Shakespeare because you need to have that on your resume, there, there, nothing wrong. And and you should and you may fall in love with it and want to do six of them. You know right. what I mean? Or 20 or 100 or whatever. Right. 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 And um, it's just that when you're there, that's what you're doing. And and it's a great way to learn and it's a great way to get comfortable on stage and get comfortable in your skin and find your voice. Um, and, and there's a lot of supportive people and, and, and that was what's really great about it. And then the West Coast is a whole different trip. It's, it's all about trying to, um, trying to make something happen, you right. know. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's tough, uh, but it's different, you know. And a lot of the a lot of the comedy scene and the theater scene, it's like you go, hey, yeah, yeah, I should do a play or I should do uh, do some improv or something, and you start doing it, and then they'll say, uh, can you bring audience? Mm-hmm. You guys got to get people in, and so you become this like marketing person. Ex- I've get heard that before. The theater, <laughs> as opposed to the guy who just wants to perform and be funny on stage, you're the guy who's also a ticket barker. <laughs> <you know. laughs> But that's this is the way it is. Yeah. So. so we got the unfortunate, a lot of sad news this week in the entertainment world. Uh, one of which was former 90210 and Riverdale star Luke Perry, who passed away. Now, yes. to my understanding, you had the chance and opportunity to play a role in that mega popular <laughs> series, not the remix, the original 1997 series. That first, is correct. First, I want to get your thoughts on Luke Perry. I was untimely patron death. in bar. <laughs> yes, you are. First, <laughs> I, I want to get your uh, thoughts on the untimely death of Luke Perry. And then second, uh, what was it like being on a set of that show? <clears throat> well, as far as Luke goes, I didn't work with him. Mm-hmm. He wasn't uh, He wasn't in the scene that I worked with that day. Right. Uh, from everyone I talked to, he was a great guy, very friendly, very outgoing Um uh, and a, just a good actor and a good guy to be around. Right. And it's really, it's really sad. Um, uh, uh, strokes are tough. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, he had a massive stroke. And yeah. even if he came back from that, it's that, that is really hard. And I think, especially with somebody who is an actor, performer who yeah. uses their voice and their body and their face and everything for their craft. It's particularly it's it's bad when it happens to anybody. Yeah. But I think that's a particularly bad. I think it's very hard for for somebody like that to then have that happen to them. Right. Um, I mean, uh, well, uh, we all know examples, people like Tim Curry. Yeah. You know, you just feel sad. And I, it's good that he's come back and he's done. Uh, and, and for many years, you know, I worked for Dick Clark. I don't know if 
you, you knew that on my not um, only did I know it, that was going to be my next question segueing over. <laughs> but we had the same, you know, I had the same experience, and I, I knew Dick on a very personal level. Mm-hmm. But to see him sort of struggle with the um, to to try and present the way he used to present and host right. the way he used to host, and it's just those those muscles aren't there anymore. You know, he had, he'd spent his whole life creating this thing and, and to try and that was so easy. His, his whole, his whole persona persona was so easy and so relaxed and to then see him struggle. I mean, it was really, really hard. So, and I, I don't know if it's a blessing, but I mean, if it was his time, it was his time. And I just, you know, it might have been the better outcome than being, you know, the other. And, and that's hor- maybe horrible to say. I don't know. But, but if it was me, I would be like, I'd, you know, if I had a massive stroke, I'd be, I'd rather be gone, you know, in a, in a lot of ways. I know, because I, 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 totally I know understand. it's tough. And I don't, I don't know if that's the politically correct thing to say or not, you know, whatever. And, and I, hey, I have a lot of praise for people who have. People like Dick, you know, who went out there and they – people gave him a hard time and said – he'd get a lot of reviews in the paper like Dick should hang it up. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to watch and, you know, you turn on the New Year's Rock and Eve and he's struggling to do it and, yeah. uh, you know, we don't need to see that. And I, the one hand, I was like, <clears throat> I get where you're coming from. On the other hand, I'm like, that's life. Mm-hmm. This is – He's representative of our parents, our grandparents, our people are that we love that are in our life and that these things happen to and you don't throw them away. Right. You don't you just don't go, well it's I, it makes me uncomfortable. Well, too bad. This will maybe make you more comfortable when it happens to somebody closer to you. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's a good thing. And you know, you can have empathy and 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 maybe you can even find joy in the fact that Here's this guy. He's just he's still out there. He's still doing it, and he's he's just you know still working along. Right. And he could quit any time, but he feels it's it's part of who he is to keep going. And, and you got to love that that side of it too. Right. So, uh, maybe Luke would have been one of those guys too. Uh, he probably would have been because you know he's a very driven person. A lot of actors that survive in this town are the ones that survive are driven. They, you know, you don't see them retiring, like walking away very often. Right. It happens, but you know, so anyway, it's all sad. It's very sad. It is so. very much. But, uh, what was it like working on a set of that show at the time? Oh, well that show. So <laughs> I, uh, I was a uh, bar patron number two. Mm-hmm. The premise was the peach pit was taken over for super bowl. <laughs> and, uh, Brian Austin green had decided we're going to turn the peach pit into a sports bar for one night mm-hmm. and Tip- Tiffany Amber Thiessen was in the sh- in that episode as well oh, and of course everything wasn't working he couldn't get the cash register open he couldn't and I was a bar patron was like hey can we get some service down here what's going on <laughs> you know, Super Bowl for crying out loud <laughs> and um, the funny thing about that so they were all very friendly mm-hmm. and they had been doing the show for a long time and I had a dressing room that was right across from Tori Spellings and um uh, they came in and they got my dinner order and they said, you know, is pizza f- okay? And I said, sure, yeah, I'll have whatever. Pizza's fine. Mm-hmm. They ended up bringing me a whole large pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I thought you were like ordering pizza for the crew, for the cast. Like we'd all have a slice. I'm fine. And it's like, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this whole pizza, you know? So I ended up taking it home. But uh, uh, I remember Tori Spelling was sitting across the hall and she was watching – because it was had been on long enough now that it was also in syndication. Right. So we were shooting at around two in the afternoon, and at three o'clock, nine o two one o would come on because it was the early episodes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she was like, "Oh, do you remember when so and so had that haircut?" And you know, and I could hear her from across the hall. It was very funny. <laughs> like she was watching the show and then calling other cast members in, like Ian. Uh, I, well, like Ian, what's Ian's last name? Zewing. Z- uh, so like the Sharknado guy. I can't think of his name. It's Ian Ziering, right. Ziering, so, yeah, that's what it is. Oh, you got to look at your hair and you got to, you know, <laughs> I can't believe you wore that coat and stuff like that. It was very funny. Um, but in a way, that was their high school. And can you imagine if you had a camera a camera of of your high school when you went to high school and then they they did episodes about it? <laughs> 
<laughs> and then you could see it like 10 years see it 10 years later you'd be crazy you know? no i get freaked out every time i watch like eddie murphy's trading places because it was done down here <laughs> in philadelphia here <laughs> oh let alone, right let alone dick clark in american bandstand which is like the old studio is right down the street from me <laughs> oh that's crazy that's great <laughs> so, so anyway they oh just to put a button on it they were yeah. all very nice uh, it was a good set to be on. They had been doing it for a long time, so everybody was on their game. I was like, okay, I just got to fit into this thing and try and be, you know, not screw up. That was my big thing. And here's what's real funny. I don't know if this is interesting or not, but when you're on a stage like that, so we had a lot of, it was a lot of activity in the background. It was supposed to be loud noise and people cheering at, you know, football plays and all that kind of stuff. Right. And but when they shoot it, it's you could drop. Pin drop, quiet, mm. super quiet, like everything. And so Brian Austin Green's having trouble um, working the cash register, and Tiffany Amner Thiessen comes in, and she's trying to tell him, like, this wasn't a good idea or something like that. And I'm at the end of the bar, and I'm waiting for my cue so I can yell my line. Mm. But they're down there by the cash register now, and they're having a conversation like this. I don't think this was a good idea. I just feel <laughs> Maybe maybe you could come and help me out a little bit just because it's, it's crazy here. Right. But it's supposed to be a crowded, loud. Right, <laughs> not, right, right. Meanwhile, it is quiet in the room and I'm trying to hear. I cannot hear my line, my cue <laughs> to yell my thing. And I'm like, oh, God, I hope this is it. And then I would just yell, hey, can I get some help down here? Which was what my line was. And, it, you know. Uh, apparently I did it okay because they didn't cut me out of the episode. And uh, uh, But I thought it was very funny because they, they whispered on set. It was very, very funny. So, <laughs> that's interesting. So that's the story on that. That's awesome. So, so with you playing both animation and live action, um, do you prefer one style of acting over the other or would just, it's whatever comes your way? I love it all. I You know, back to when I was a little kid, just want to play all the characters. Uh it seems now as I've gotten older, the I mean, the voice acting is the thing that's sort of been consistent, mm -hmm. and I've always had something going with that. Naruto now just rolls into Boruto, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, you know, we just keep going on, keep going on. And, uh, and it, it always – the live stuff, I, I don't know. It's, it's more of a struggle just in that finding time and um, uh, just – committing to doing a play or committing uh -huh. to doing a uh or like i said there's a lot of especially with like improv out here it's it's like i'd love to get back up there and do it yeah but i don't want to have to dig up an audience and i don't <laughs> <laughs> i don't you know i don't want to i've done all that you know right. i used to uh, i worked for the disney cruise line doing improv many years ago and that was great like they just bring you a full house every night and when you have a full house and people that you've been working with on a regular basis mm -hmm. uh you're funny you know it it works and uh when you rehearse once a week and you get your time slot on a friday night and there's four people in the audience you're awful <laughs> you know it's uh it, you could be the best comedian in the world and if there's five people in that audience you're like oh man this is not gonna fly right. so that's the that's the frustrating part about it uh, out here but that's you know that's i'm on my, everybody's on their own journey that's mine <laughs> <laughs> so who would you uh this may be this question may get you in trouble but who would you uh consider your favorite actor or actress to work with oh boy um I, I, a lot of are you talking about on the show or are you talking on the uh, i would just say in general um boy it's tough because what what ends up happening is when you work on a show or if you work uh in a comedy company mm -hmm. you create friends and little kind of core groups of actor friends mm -hmm. and sometimes they co-mingle and sometimes uh everybody seems to know everybody and other times you're like oh that's weird that you two don't know each other because we both you know and so you end up creating this sort of core of people around you right. that you've enjoyed working with and you would uh, there's probably a hundred 200 people that i've actually worked with that i'd love listen i'm not going to turn down any job so right. first of all but it, I would love to work with, you know, um, like I said, Miley and I used to do comedy together. Mm -hmm. She was a lot of fun when it comes to the Naruto show. Mm -hmm. I know 
I might see them coming or going and it's a hello and then, oh, how was it going? And then they leave and <laughs> then I do my thing. And, you you know, every once in a while you do a convention and you'll see that person. And it's like, wow, we've been on a show for 15 years and I've talked to you once. <laughs> you know, uh, and we're, you know, you're you're a character that I talk to all the time on screen, but I never see you. So it's it is very funny that way. Um, Single so, proof life. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a tough question to ask. Like, who's your favorite person to work with? I I try to be the kind of actor that is that everybody would want to work with, and that I would want to work with just about anybody. Um, you know, that's that's the goal anyway. That's what you want to be, and that's you know, I, most of I know a lot of great women actors that are fun. Did you did you make it actresses or did you make it? Well, it, it, you know what? It's always a tricky thing because they're actors or anybody. No, it just because depending on who I interview, it's actors or actresses, and it doesn't matter. Or oh. Actors in general for everybody. So yeah, it's tough. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, everybody I've met on that's on Naruto has been great. You know, uh, everybody's friendly. I think voiceover it, it, it's a whole different. It's very relaxed. You come in. You know, you'll run into somebody in the hall and it's like, oh, hey, how are you? And, hey, you know, you back and forth and you see each other for five minutes and everybody's happy. And right. it's it's such a you don't when you're doing a play and it's the fifth week and you're in tech week and the things aren't running right and you're having trouble with your lines and, you know, everybody's on edge because it's 11 o'clock at night and you just want to go home. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a little more drama that happens and there's a little bit more um uh, th things get said and people get into little fights and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, as far as this show, every, I think everybody uh, loves each other on this show because, you know, we don't we're not around each other enough to hate each other. Right. <laughs> and I, you know what? It's funny you said that because I do get that. I do get that feeling talking to each and every one. I've talked to Stephanie Shea. I've talked to Kyle Haber, um, Molly, of course, um, even Amanda, you know, recently um, playing Barto. Everybody has that same rapport, and when they talk about the other cast members, it's, it feels like a very genuine love, uh, you know, love yeah, family feel. I, I think if anything, you would say, "Oh, I don't know that person. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met that person. I, I, I don't know. I've seen their work on the screen, and it's great, but I don't, I don't know that person." Right. So, uh, it, yeah, it's funny. So. Yeah. Tom, thank you so very much for being on the show. I really, really appreciate it. It's been such a treat having you on. Um, right now, I just want to know what's next for you. Well, it's bar. It's Boruto's moving forward. We're going on mm -hmm. onward and upward, you know, uh, and I audition all the time. So there's nothing really, um, any, any con appearances or anything coming up? No, you know, here's the funny thing about con appearances. People ask me like, why don't you do more con appearances? And I'm like, I, nobody's asking, <laughs> You know, I've done a couple of them, right. and I've just been like, "Hey, and if you want me to come to your con, I'm, you know, I'll consider it." It, it depends. There's timing and stuff, but for the most part, I'm a, I'm a, sure, absolutely, Maybe give me a call, I'll come do it. <laughs> so I think on my Wikipedia page, I looked at it once, and uh, something because I went to Anime Con, they brought the whole Naruto cast there, right? Um, in uh, 2006 it was like the first year we did it like it was a big deal they had 35 people on stage to talk about the show and uh somebody wrote in there like you know mr gibbous made a rare uh con appearance <laughs> <laughs> roll out the red carpet like, here he comes <laughs> like i'm prince or something i'm a recluse you know i'm just i'm living in uh, i don't want to see the public i don't well, want to you know, hey you are from minnesota so you know <laughs> yeah, absolutely he's uh he's my guy but um yeah so it's funny like I, i'm not avoiding <laughs> i i uh I, i've done a few of them and i i've enjoyed them mm -hmm. and uh anybody out there that uh wants me to come to their con just you know call the organizer give me a call i'll try and make it happen sounds so. like a plan well tom again thank you so very much i definitely appreciate you being on and i uh, hope you enjoyed yourself Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you very much enjoyed this Naruto-filled episode. On behalf of myself and Shikamaru himself, Tom Gibbous, all I got to say is learn to let go, live life, and love all things anime, comics, movies, and games. This is ACMG Presents Talk Time Live. We are out of here. Take care. Whatever.
This episode of ACMG Presents Talk Time Live is brought to you in part by Viewfinders Identity Search and Design. Your choice for web design, graphic design, and all multimedia development needs. Visit VFISAD.com and let us bring your vision to reality.